So when we left off, the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union was clearly degrading. Um, <clears throat> it seemed like every few months um, there would be another situation where we would not be on the same page. Um, the wartime allies were clearly no longer um, going in the same direction. And for members of the Truman administration and, and the government at large, there was some confusion. You know, it seemed, it seemed amazing to them that after several years of pretty decent cooperation, um, millions upon millions of dollars worth of American aid and arms and support during the war, um, all these things that all of a sudden, um, you know, a country that helped us win World War II had, had basically ceased to be an ally and had become an adversary. Um, <clears throat> and as your book said, um, the British foreign minister and the American secretary of state um, began to become quite concerned. Matter of fact, the British foreign minister, Ernest Bevan, um, said that our relations with the Russians are drifting into the, into the same condition as that in which we found ourselves with Hitler. Um, basically meaning kind of, you know, in those, in those last couple years of appeasement before World War II started. Um, the United States government lost as to what to do next and also lost as to what was happening, sent a request to our embassy in Moscow for more information for, for their take on it. The theory being that our diplomats and, and our staff that worked at the embassy in Moscow, they knew the Russians better. They were, they were right there in the heart of it all. They had a more personal relationship with many of these um, Russian diplomats and, and, and decision makers. And maybe they had some insight that the people in Washington didn't have. And so we our, our government you know, requested some explanation, you know, their take on what was going on with the Soviets. On February 22nd, George Kennan, who was a diplomat working at the Moscow embassy, responded. His message is known in history as the Long Telegram. It was a 5,540-word message where he explained what was going on. And here's basically what he said. He said, first of all, you have to remember these are Russians, okay? Which means what? They've got that Russian worldview, which I talked about. They are insecure. Look at their history. Understand that they are a people who have been repeatedly invaded from the West, specifically Germany. Um, they are distrustful of Westerners. And communism and Lenin and Stalin and all the boys have only made it worse. He also pointed out, remember, they are communists. And remember the, the message of communism, the end goal of communism. You know, read your communist manifesto. We are the enemy, right? And so he said, you have to understand that the way that they look at the world is the West is their enemy. We cannot be friends. There's no such thing as coexistence between capitalism and communism in a communist worldview. And he said, therefore, you have to understand it's impossible for us to ever reach a long-term alliance or friendship even, that we are bound to be enemies. It's impossible. He said, now that you got that in mind, okay, now that you've understood that and you've realized that, all right, <clears throat> you have three options, okay? I will try to write this out. Um, he said, you basically have three options, okay? The first one um, would be called rollback. All right, now we didn't do this one, but this was what he suggested were our options, our possibilities. Roll back. What do we mean? Go to war. Dry, start World War III, basically, or just continue World War II where we left off and send the American army at the Soviets and fight for the continent of Europe all over again um, and have another bloodbath on our hands. Basically said, if you don't like communism, then go to war with them. Another option is just do nothing. Just sit back, watch the Soviets, you know, do their thing, watch them conquer Eastern Europe, watch them institute their, their dictatorships, etc., and see what happens. But then he made a third proposal, which was kind of an in-between, and it becomes known as containment. Containment is our game plan for the Cold War, for most of the Cold War. 
What does containment mean? He said, we need to plan for a long-term vigilant commitment against Russian expansive tendencies. He basically said, look, the Russian system has got some major political, social, and economic weaknesses. And if we can hold the Soviets where they are, if we can keep them from expanding and spreading and gaining new allies and new resources and things of that nature, the system will eventually collapse under its own weight, under its own flaws and failures. I'm going to go ahead and, and jump off the rails for a moment from where your book said. This is like the Romans in some ways. Um, if you guys learned about, about Rome in World Civ, um, when the Roman Empire stopped successfully conquering and, and spreading and acquiring new territory. That's actually when the Roman Empire began to sort of collapse slowly but surely because the Roman Empire was built on expansion. Um, that was kind of its entire existence. Like, like that's, that's what kept it moving forward. And that's kind of what George Kennan was saying about the Soviet system and communism. The only way it's going to survive is if it keeps gobbling up countries. You know, the only way the Soviets are going to keep moving ahead is by conquering people. That the Soviet system is inherently flawed, and it's wasteful, and it's corrupt, and it will slowly fall apart. You've just got to hold it in place. That doesn't mean going to war. It's not rollback. You accept the fact that they've conquered Eastern Europe. You accept the fact that they're in control of the Soviet Union. But you don't allow them to go further. They might be in Hungary. They might be in Poland and East Germany. But you don't let them go to West Germany. You don't let them go to Austria, right? You keep them in place. Um, it's obviously not do nothing because we're not just going to stand back. We're basically going to draw a line and say no further and then wait for them to collapse. Now, somebody, of course, responded with, how long are we talking, George? I don't know. Could be decades. He was very honest, and this is a long-term game plan. It might be a generation before we win. Turns out it was basically two generations. Um, but this is going to be our playbook, basically. Um, <clears throat> keeping communism within its present territory, and by the way, using diplomacy, economics, military force, all right, whatever it takes. Beg, borrow, steal, <laughs> bribe people, buy people, you know, fight wars, whatever it's going to take, as we shall see. Now, containment's going to get put to the test pretty quickly, and it's going to get put to the test um, in a little place called Iran. Um, <clears throat> there's actually going to be a series of crises in 1946 that are going to kind of test our resolve. It's, it's not very far into 1946. Again, George Kennan wrote this in February. It's only going to be a month later that America has to kind of make a decision as to how we're going to handle things. Okay. During World War II, Iran was a supply route. Um, basically, supplies from the United States would go around Africa, up the east coast of Africa, and then we would land them on the southern coast of Iran, and then we would truck them across Iran into the southern portions of the Soviet Union. And so Iran was a supply corridor. During the war, to protect the supply line, American troops occupied southern Iran and Soviet troops occupied northern Iran. Of course, the plan was when the war was over, everybody would go home. Well, we went home, the Soviets didn't. Soviet troops remained in northern Iran, and Stalin began demanding access to some of the oil in, in Iran. Um, <clears throat> the Soviets were also supporting um, communists in northern Iran. Not that there was a communist government per se, but there, of course, was a communist party, a communist movement within Iran. And the Soviets were offering these people their support, basically trying to pressure either Iran to go communist or to let the northern portion of the country break away. American officials saw this as the first, of a, the first real move of a Soviet push to take control of the Middle East. You know, that this was, this was a new area that they were going to try and spread their influence into. We decided it was time to send a strong message. We demanded the Soviets withdraw. We sent the battleship USS Missouri into the eastern Mediterranean. Um, we basically started to put American forces on a higher alert, kind of sent the signal to the Soviets, we're not happy. And in the meantime, um, the Soviets, they, they withdrew, but the Iranians had promised to create a joint oil company that basically the Iranians and the Russians would share and it would supply the Russians with oil 
Um, interestingly enough, after the Soviet troops left Iran, the Iranian parliament vetoed that measure, and the Soviets, they withdrew, but they never got their oil company. So they kind of got um, double-crossed, so to speak, on that one. After getting the boot sort of pressured out of Iran, Joseph Stalin then made a push on Turkey, more specifically the Dardanelles. The Dardanelles are that little strip of water, and I'm going to jump ahead real quick to show you. This little strip of water right here is the Dardanelles. This is the Black Sea. This is the Soviet Union over here, right? The Black Sea is one of their major waterways. Now, in order for any ships, for example, the major military or naval base for the Soviet Union on the Black Sea was right here in Crimea, Sevastopol, right here. In order for ships from Sevastopol to get out anywhere and do anything, you've got to go through this thin strip of water called the Dardanelles, um, the Bosphorus. Now, that is all Turkish. As you can see, Turkey is on the both South Shore and North Shore. It's their waterway. And so the Soviets desperately wanted to be guaranteed to be able to transit through there, to have access through the Dardanelles. So they began pressuring the Soviets, excuse me, the Soviets began pressuring the Turks to grant them uh, not joint access, but joint control, that basically the, Turkey, the Turkish government and the Soviet government would share it. Joseph Stalin kept pressuring the Turks, and in August of 1946, um, our, our advisor, the president, Dean Acheson, he saw this as a Soviet attempt to again find a new backdoor, so to speak, into the Middle East, since Turkey backs right up to the Middle East. And President Truman said famously, we might as well find out whether the Russians are bent on world conquest. He ordered an American aircraft battle group along with the USS Missouri off the coast of Turkey, sending a strong message to the Soviets. Um, with you know the United States backing up Turkey, right next door in Greece, there was another situation. Here's Turkey, here's Greece. Right next door in Greece, there had been a communist uprising for months. Um, <clears throat> for about the past six months, the British government had been funding the Greek government in a fight to prevent a communist uprising or insurgency. So communist guerrillas had been trying to topple the Greek government. And for the last six months or so, the, the British government had been basically funding the Greek government's war effort. But the British were basically out of money, thanks to all the money they'd spent in World War II. And they told us this by early 1947. In February of 1947, they told the United States they, they literally had no money left to support the Greek government. And so on March 12, 1947, Harry Truman went before the Congress and asked for $400 million to help fight communist aggression to support the Greek and Turkish governments. He then went on in his speech to outline what we today call the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine, um, like some of the previous doctrines that we've learned about in this class, like um, the Monroe Doctrine, for example, this is the idea that this is a broad foreign policy stance of the United States, right? Like this is how the U.S. is going to handle this in general. And what he said was the goal of the United States was to aid, quote, free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressure. Now, in the short run, the United States has committed herself to supporting the Turks and the Greeks against communism. In the long run, we have committed the United States to fight communism globally, worldwide, anyone, anywhere. If your government is facing a communist uprising, a communist insurgency, communist terrorists, you name it, Give America a call, and we will be there to back you. We are here to help governments stop the spread of communism. It's containment, right? Now, that helps take care of issues in places like Turkey and Greece and Iran and wherever else. But you have to remember, one of the other big question marks was, what is going to be the fate of Western Europe? Uh, most people today, of course, don't really worry about the fate of Western Europe necessarily, but it was a really dicey situation in the mid to late 1940s. The economy of Europe had been ravaged. Numerous countries had been battlegrounds. Um, there had been all sorts of chaos and upheaval. The winter of 1946 had seen mass starvation throughout the continent. And there were communist and socialist parties in all of these countries. Matter of fact, 
side note, before the start of the First World War, the largest party in Germany had been the Social Democratic Party. In the years before World War II started in France, there had been a coalition government that had been dominated by socialists. There had obviously been a socialist um, and communist movement in Britain, although one that had become more democratic than radical. You might remember that Benito Mussolini had in fact been a socialist before he became a fascist. So all of these countries had socialist or communist movements within them. And we were all afraid, well, the United States was afraid that in times of chaos, in times of upheaval, when people are hungry, when people are poor and angry and unemployed, etc., it's very easy to blame someone else and then say, you know, someone jump up and say, I've got all the answers like Hitler had done. And so there was a real fear that if we didn't rebuild these economies, these countries could fall to communism. They were ripe for the picking. Right. Communists would roll in and say the problem is, I don't know, America or capitalism or whatever. Follow us, you know, and there you'll have it. And so the idea was we've got to get the economy of Europe rebuilt. We've got to get these countries back up and running and happy and healthy so they don't turn communist. The answer became the European Recovery Program, or as everyone calls it, the Marshall Plan. The real name was the European Recovery Program, but George Marshall, Secretary of State, proposed it, so he gets his name on it. $13 billion in economic aid to all these countries that you see here in green. Now, the more, you know, the taller this bar, the more money they got. Um, but you can see... The, the largest amounts went to Britain, um, not really afraid of them going communist, but we needed them to be strong to help us out. You can see a good amount went to France, a large amount to West Germany, Italy not far behind, and then all these other countries who actually probably got less damage in World War II, they all got a check as well. Um, <clears throat> as Harry Truman liked to say, the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine were two halves of the same walnut. He saw them as going hand in hand when it came to containment. He saw the Marshall Plan was the economic aid package that would help fight off communism. Meanwhile, the Truman Doctrine was kind of the military aspect that America was offering on the table as well. I do want to point out these guys were all eligible. We offered it to anyone in Europe, not just to our friends. We offered it to all of the governments of Eastern Europe and even the Soviets. Instead, the Soviets told all of their satellite states, if you remember from reading in 26.1, they told all of these Eastern European satellites they were not allowed to take funding from the Marshall Plan. Instead, the Soviets came up with their own economic aid package, which basically meant there was no money. Um, because the Soviets didn't have a whole lot of money for themselves, much less to give to their neighbors. And so the Marshall Plan only went to these countries, and we pumped billions of dollars into them to rebuild them. And by the early 1950s, you wouldn't know that there had been a war in many of these countries. They were rebuilt, they got back on their feet, employment picked up, the economies picked up, and everyone became relatively happy and very not communist, which was our goal. But we're not done having crises one after another. <clears throat> Matter of fact, gentlemen, the United States and her friends had decided, um, and I'm jumping ahead of myself in a way by saying there's a crisis, but we decided in 1948, it's obvious that we and the Soviets aren't friends anymore. And it's obvious that the Soviets are, you know, every time we turn around, the Soviets are kind of reaching out, trying to get their claws into something. We decided that we need to build our own little kind of buffer, right? They've got their iron curtain, so to speak. Well, we need to be prepared on our side of the curtain. And so the decision was made that we were going to unite the American, the British, and the French sectors of Western Germany and create a country, West Germany. So we united our three sectors to create the new country of West Germany. It was a country. They had their own government. The capital was in the city of Bonn, since Berlin was still in eastern Germany. I do want to point out that this country did not have a military. All three of the allies pledged to use their militaries to defend western Germany. Now, by creating a new independent country, 
we're not only sending a signal to the Soviets that we've forgiven the Germans <laughs> and that they're on our team, but because it's a country, they can now refuse to give the Soviets anything. Remember those reparations? Remember how the Soviets were stripping East Germany bare and they were supposed to, if they wanted anything, pay for it with food? Now that it's an independent country, West Germany can simply reject any offers the Soviets make. The Soviets could offer them all the grain in East Germany for a factory, and West Germany could say no thank you. And so realizing that their chance to get reparations from West Germany was coming to an end, the Soviets decided to make a play. All right? They decided that they were going to see just how strong the West was and how committed the West was. In June of 1948, they cut all road and rail traffic off to West Berlin. Please remember, Berlin is in the heart of the Soviet sector. Let's get an eraser up there. Where's the eraser? There you go. Okay. Berlin is in the heart of the Soviet sector. Okay. Right here. So, in order for anything from West Germany to get to West Berlin, which is still technically part of Western Germany, it's an enclave, geographically speaking, it would have to go by road or rail. The Soviets cut it off. They isolated it from everything. And they said that they wouldn't open the roads and they wouldn't open the, the train stations basically until the West gave in to their demands. This, of course, is a crisis. Harry Truman famously sent B-29s and atomic weapons to air bases in Britain. It looked like this might be the start of World War III. The American commander in Germany he warned that if Berlin fell, West Germany would fall soon after. Um, because basically we would send the message that we weren't willing to fight for this part of West Germany, so West Germany would lose confidence and surrender. It would be the beginning of the end. There was talk of just sending a supply convoy across the border and basically challenging the Russians to take a shot. Um, but several people pointed out that that was just asking for a war. That's when the newly created United States Air Force stood up. Um, there was an Air Force in World War II, but it was part of the Army. It was called the U.S. Army Air Corps. The newly independent United States Air Force stood up and said, we've got the answer. We will fly supplies to Berlin. Yes, we will have to fly over Soviet territory, but we won't literally drive across the border. Right? We won't challenge their border guards. We won't smash through a gate or a barricade. We'll just fly over. Tell them that it's a supply aircraft and make it very clear. If you shoot at one of them, you're starting World War III, right? We're carrying medicine and food for women and children. Don't fire. Um, President Truman was like, can you guys really do that? I mean, Berlin's home to like a million people. You're going to keep a million people alive. You're going to keep them fed. You're going to provide them with all the medicine that they need, everything. And they were like, yeah, man, we got tons of aircraft from World War II and storage. We got this. And so, for 11 months, cargo planes supplied Berlin with everything. Food, medicine, coal, gasoline, you name it, it was flown in. Round the clock, um, over 2 million tons of supplies were delivered to Berlin during this 11-month period. It was known as Operation Vittles. It was actually the first major operation of the Air Force. It was a miraculous feat. I would like to point out, too, this is World War II cargo planes. This is not some 747 that you see out at the CVG DHL terminal. Okay, these are aircraft that haul about as much cargo, you know, as you could fit in a couple of school buses if you're lucky. All right, these are not monstrous airplanes, okay, that could haul enormous amounts. Um, we are talking tens of thousands of flights had to be performed over 11 months. Um, not a single plane was shot down. The Soviets understood that they would, they would be starting World War III if they did that. After 11 months, it became obvious we were going to do this for eternity if that's what it took. And so Joseph Stalin took down the barricades. And the Berlin airlift was a success. Was a success. And Berlin, at that point, became a symbol of American containment and resolve, right? That America would stop at nothing to stop the spread of communism. Berlin is going to come up again and again in the Cold War. It is like a flashpoint. The Berlin blockade 
convinced many Americans that the Soviets are clearly unhinged. I mean, they basically tried to starve a million civilians to get what they wanted. And so in response, we and 11 other countries created the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. In April of 1949, this organization was created. It included, this is not going to be on a test, but if you're curious, the United States, Canada, Britain, France, Italy, Belgium, Denmark, Portugal, the Netherlands, Norway, Luxembourg, and Iceland. Um, NATO, gentlemen, was a defensive alliance. The plan was that if any, or the way it was written out, if any member was attacked, it was believed or written that all members would come to their aid. Right, So it was a truly defensive alliance made up of 12 countries. Um, the NATO alliance is significant, be, significant excuse me, because it marks the first time in American history that we had joined an alliance like this and that we had committed ourselves to maintaining peace abroad. Now, some of you are like, we've been in alliances before. We just were in one in World War II. Yeah, that was war. There's no war. We are in peacetime committing ourselves to ending up in a war, right? Remember, Americans love to pick and choose when we go to war. The NATO alliance basically assures us that if France gets attacked, we're going to war. We don't have a choice on this one. So NATO is a significant departure in American foreign policy history. Six years later, in 1955, the United States and her NATO allies decided to allow West Germany to become a full-fledged NATO member to rearm to build her own independent military and become a full member of NATO. Um, this actually triggered the Soviets into making their own alliance, um, which is known as the Warsaw Pact. It included the Soviet Union, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, which I don't know if you people even know about Albania. It's not really a heavy hitter. They later allowed East Germany to do the same thing and rearm and become a full-fledged member. But basically what we now have is two big alliances staring at each other in Europe. Now, those of you who might remember Chapter 19, remember the last time we had two big alliances staring at each other in Europe, it led to the First World War. And so that's why a lot of people saw NATO and the Warsaw Pact as maybe history getting ready to repeat itself. Let's see if it does. I do want to take a moment here to point out, we've done a lot of talk about Europe, and it's a big world out there. Yep, the Cold War is going to take place elsewhere. For example, in China. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Before we can have the Cold War, we have to have World War II in China. And before we can have World War II in China, we have to have the Civil War in China. In the 1920s, there had been a civil war in China. The old monarchy had collapsed after centuries of rule, and there had been a civil war between Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists and General Chiang Kai-shek, who led the nationalists. Basically, Chiang Kai-shek was trying to institute a more Western-style democratic government, and Mao was trying to institute communism. This was a bitter civil war that actually got put on hold when the Japanese invaded. When the Japanese invaded China, um, Mao and Chiang Kai-shek basically combined their armies to fight off the foreign invaders. And then, like, the minute the Japanese were defeated, they called time back in and they went back to war with each other. Now, we supported the nationalists. Obviously, a country now committed to the policy of containment, does not want to see a communist victory in China. And so we sent billions of dollars in aid to Mr. Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist army. Actually, in the mid-1940s, um, we by the mid-1940s, we had sent them um, $2 billion. But there was corruption in Chiang Kai-shek's government, uh, and in his military, they squandered much of the aid money. There was a lot of embezzling. Um, also, your book doesn't mention it, but I feel like I need to, to mention it. Um, Mao and his army were fanatically committed to, to their cause. At one point, they were basically trapped. Um, Chiang Kai-shek and his army were moving in for the kill. 
and Mao and his army had no way to escape except into the Himalaya mountains and Tibet. And that's exactly what they did. His army went on what is called the Long March, where like for a year they were basically on the run. And when I say on the run, I mean they were running through some of the most inhospitable terrain you can imagine, and they did it. Um, so that was the other problem. These guys were fighting an army that would just would not surrender. Eventually, Chiang Kai-shek and his boys were able to uh, go on the offensive. In 1949, they captured Beijing, and they began driving the nationalists basically out of China. In August of 1949, the United States government quit supporting Chiang Kai-shek because we realized he'd wasted all that money we gave him. The nationalists were finally defeated and forced to flee. Um, they fled to nearby Formosa, which is the small island country of Taiwan today. And in October of 1949, Mao and um, his army proclaimed the People's Republic of China, a communist country, in October of 1949. And I was hoping, here you go, really quickly, there is Taiwan right there. Um, so... Mr. Chiang Kai-shek and his army were defeated and forced to flee to this tiny island off the coast of China. Um, <clears throat> and so in October of 1949, the communists declare victory in China. The fall of China um, was actually the second in a horrible one-two punch combo for the United States. We found out in September of 1949 that our nuclear monopoly no longer existed that in fact the soviet union had successfully tested her first atomic bomb and so america no longer was the only owner of atomic weapons um also hot on the heels of that of the you know again this one-two punch um, in early 1950, the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union openly became allies. They signed a treaty of friendship. And we became convinced that China and the Soviet Union were now going to tag team to spread communist revolution throughout the world. And it looks like they're primed to do it. I mean, you think about it. Once Mao wins in China... The communists are now in control of all this, and we'll even include Mongolia, because basically Mongolia was a communist puppet. Like, this whole chunk of the world is now communist. They've got a lot of neighbors that they can go after now, right? There's a lot of parts of the world that they touch that they can start working their way into. <clears throat> I do want to point out that the United States did not recognize the communist government that Mao instituted in Beijing. Um, this is where I have up here UN games. You might recall back in chapter 25, section 5, I talked about the United Nations and how at the end of World War II, or right before the end of World War II, we created the UN. And an institution of the UN is the Security Council. And there are five countries that have permanent seats on the Security Council. Those countries are the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, France, and China. Now, please remember, when we made that arrangement, the communists were not in control of China. And now, here, it looks like we've just given the communists another seat on the Security Council. The United States did not allow that to fly. We used our veto power where we only recognize Taiwan. So little island of Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek is supposed to be a member of the Security Council um, and not Mao Zedong and the 600 million Chinese on the mainland. The Chinese Revolution, or the success of the Chinese Communist, I will say, also brought about a shift in American policy, um, specifically towards Japan. If there was a winner out of China, it's Japan. At the end of World War II, we occupied Japan. Douglas MacArthur and the United States Army, not exactly invaded, but American troops were put in Japan. And our job was to introduce democracy and basically try and transform Japan into a peace-loving, democratic country. Once we lost China to the communists, we changed our stance and took the approach. We had to make Japan a legit player in the Asian sphere. Because we needed 
Japan to now serve as a buffer against communist expansion. Once we lost China to the communists, we desperately need this country to be able to serve as like a base to prevent further communist expansion into the southern Pacific, right? Um, we need an ally. Right? We've got plenty of allies over here. We need an ally in Asia. We've been banking on it being China, but now that China's gone, we need Japan to be our ally. And so we are going to, just like we did with the Marshall Plan in Western Europe, we are going to send enormous amounts of financial aid, economic aid actually, to the Japanese to rebuild their country. And by the mid-1950s, you'd have no idea that we firebombed Japan into surrender. Um, we rebuilt that country and made it an economic powerhouse. And it's just in time that we changed our policy on Japan because, well, we're about to have a war in a place called Korea. Now, before we get all fired up about this, at the end of World War II, the Americans and the Soviets basically went into Korea and they divided it. The plan was to divide Korea along this line here called the 38th parallel. The Soviets would oversee the northern half. The Americans would oversee the southern half. The plan was we would both basically get these places rebuilt, repaired, and functioning, and then they would have elections to reunite. Now, the, in the north, the Russians had obviously supported the creation of a communist-style government. In the South, the Americans have been backing their own government. It's on paper a democracy, but I'm going to be really honest. It was a corrupt milita military dictatorship, but it was a non-communist milita military dictatorship, so we're going to let it go. Um, well, we did let it go. Now, <clears throat> of course, neither government wanted to surrender any power to the other government, and so reunification never occurred. Basically, Korea became a permanently split peninsula, with a communist north and a non-communist south. The Soviets supplied a lot of weapons and equipment to North Korea, who built up a large, well-equipped army, and convinced Joseph Stalin that they could simply conquer South Korea. And that's exactly what they tried to do. On June 25th, 1950, North Korea launched a blitzkrieg invasion of South Korea using all sorts of equipment made in the Soviet Union. And here you go at the start. They were incredibly successful, and they steamrolled the poorly equipped, unprepared South Korean military. There were only a handful of American troops there, and Lord knows they weren't enough to slow down the onslaught from North Korea. This is the real first military test of American containment. Harry Truman went to the United Nations, and he was actually able to get a United Nations Security Council measure to call for intervention in Korea. Fun fact, the Russians weren't there. I know the Russians are on the Security Council, but they were protesting Security Council meetings because we wouldn't let Mao's government go to the Security Council meetings. So Joseph Stalin's government stopped going to the meetings, which means... When the United Nations had to vote on whether it should go to a fight in Korea, no communists were in the meeting. And so Harry Truman got the United Nations to vote that basically the UN should send troops to Korea. So it was a United Nations effort, but let's be real, the bulk of the fighting was done by the United States military. By the time the UN had basically said, let's go, the situation in Korea was dire. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let this get back to the start. The UN forces have been driven back to the Pusan perimeter. Pusan is a major port city right here. And as you can see from that map, basically we were holding on to this little toenail of Korea. The rest had been conquered. This is all we had left. That is when <clears throat> Douglas MacArthur, hero of one of the heroes of the Second World War, came up with a brilliant plan. We were going to launch a massive invasion far behind enemy lines here at Incheon and try and trap the North Korean army in South Korea. It worked beautifully. On September 15th, American forces landed deep behind the North Koreans, and they were in danger of being trapped. The North Korean army ran out of South Korea. They fled, leaving behind much of their equipment, much of their supplies. They were simply running for their lives. 
after we drove them out of north out of south korea we chased them into north korea it looked like funny enough korea was going to be united by the non-communist south as united nations forces forces drove into north korea meeting little opposition unfortunately we started getting awful close to this border and just north of this border is the country of china and recently communist china was not excited at the idea that the united nations was going to take control of all of korea and so as we got close to this border which is called the yalu river because the yalu river makes up most of the border the chinese kept warning don't go any further don't go any further don't go to the border don't don't you go to the border and we ignored them in november hundreds of thousands of chinese troops crossed the border and entered the war catching the americans and the united nations by complete surprise and forcing them to retreat all the way out of North Korea and actually back into South Korea, losing the capital city of Seoul yet again. Right there is where Seoul is, roughly speaking. Right? We were now facing the chance of not being able to get back to the starting line, so to speak. Now, Douglas MacArthur starts throwing all kinds of ideas out there. He starts talking about blockading China bombing Chinese cities, using atomic weapons, bringing Chiang Kai-shek in for an invasion of China, all sorts of stuff. President Truman refused everything MacArthur said because he didn't want to take the war into China and he didn't want to use the atomic bomb. Basically, Harry Truman was pushing for what we are going to call limited war, which we'll get to in a moment. But Harry Truman kept refusing to take it up a notch. That's when Douglas MacArthur said to the reporters when asked about it, he criticized the president, and he even said once, there is no substitute for victory. Harry Truman fired Douglas MacArthur for insubordination in April of 1951. He basically said, I cannot have my commanding general openly questioning and criticizing the decisions of the United States government on this. Um, Harry Truman took a lot of flack for firing MacArthur, who was an American hero, but he did it anyhow. Korea marks a change. Limited war. It's a new idea. We are fighting for, for not a total victory, but we have a very set objective, and that's all we want. If you think about it, we went into Korea not to conquer North Korea, not to reunite the Koreas. We went into Korea to stop a communist invasion of South Korea. In the eyes of Harry Truman, if we can get back to this line, or almost back to it, we have successfully accomplished our objective. We aren't fighting for total victory. It's a very weird concept for most Americans who just got done fighting World War II, where we fought to the bitter end, right? But the way he saw it, we're simply fighting to contain communism, not to win an absolute victory. He replaced General MacArthur with Matthew Ridgway. By mid-1951, we were basically back to the 38th parallel, as you will see here in a moment. It's a little squiggly, but it's close to where we started, right? Generally speaking, that's a little off. I apologize there. That's better. We're back to basically where we started. The war broke down into basically trench warfare with little attacks for little gain, a fight for a hill here and there. There was no major movement. And so by November of 1951, the line is basically going to be where it's going to be until it all ends. And so we begin negotiating an end to the war in November of 1951. It takes until 1953 to get an actual ceasefire. In those three years of fighting, 33,600 soldiers died in Korea, um, fighting in Korea. Uh, <clears throat> Now, wait, why do I have up there 54,000? Hold on a moment. I realized I, I made a typo. Um, I meant to type 34,000, and I typed 54,000 because I went the wrong direction. Instead of to the left of the four, I went to the right. Um, now, so we lose uh, around 34,000 uh, soldiers in the Korean War, 
uh, you'll notice that is in a three-year period. So quite a quite a, a casual account if you start to think about the amount of time we were there. Um, the Korean War, by the way, did not actually end. If you want to get technical, no cease, no, no peace treaty was signed. It was an armistice. It's a ceasefire. If you want to get technical, the Korean War was still going on. Um, you know, at the turn of the century. There was never actually an official specific end to the war. Um, the countries remained kind of at the negotiating table. But regardless, America was able to say we did what we went to do. Um, <clears throat> we had prevented the communist takeover of South Korea. Now, I will say there are several important things about Korea, though. Um, for one, the United States really took her focus off of Europe. Um, not only was this the first real military test of containment, this was by far the first truly military test of the United States when it came to containment. We'd done a lot of sending money, we'd done a lot of flexing, right? Um, we'd, we'd done a lot of talk. We actually sent troops, so we showed people we were, we were real on containment. But another thing, up until this discussion of Korea, if you've noticed, I was talking about a whole lot of Europe whole lot of Europe. The Korean War marked a shift in American focus in the battle of containment, the battle against communism, from Europe to Asia. Prior to the Korean War, um, most people, of course, were convinced that the, the, the real battleground was going to be Europe. But the Korean War convinced American policymakers that the new battleground was going to be, in fact, Asia, that Asia was the new target area for the communists. You know, you think about it. They took control of China. They built up North Korea. They launched an invasion of South Korea. Um, and so the United States is going to quickly start to make agreements and alliances with, you know, the Philippines and and. We're going to make deals with people in you know the southern parts of Asia, like South Vietnam and Thailand and all these other folks, because we are convinced that that the communists basically had given up on Europe, that they understood that NATO and Western Europe were no longer going to cave, and if they wanted to be successful, they needed to target the Middle East or Southern Asia and Southeast Asia. And so that is why you will notice, if you look at American foreign policy when it comes to the Cold War, after Korea... It seems very focused on Asia and Southeast Asia and Vietnam, and it helps explain why we will go to Vietnam, which I, I think I told you all we're going to cover the Vietnam chapter when we get done with this Cold War chapter, because it rolls right into it. Um, in 26.3, your next lecture, uh, we are going to look at what it was like to live in America during the early Cold War years. Um, we'll have another Red Scare where we freak out and accuse people of being communists and all sorts of stuff. We will also talk about a little bit about what it was like to live under the specter and threat of nuclear weapons a little bit. Uh, we'll talk more about that as well in 26.4. Um, but uh, coming up, we'll kind of get a little bit of a what was it like for the average American in the Cold War.